The UN estimates that by 2050 there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. It's estimated that 100 million tons of plastic are generated globally each year. Local authorities have been forced to close beaches due to mounds of plastic rubbish. Hello, I'm Tammy Vendange, an executive turned social entrepreneur. It's clear that Mother Nature has a plastics problem, but I think it's time to quit talking about the problem. Instead, let's talk about the solutions. This is a business podcast with an environmental mission. And as your host of the Plastics Revolution, I'm going to chat with the innovators, change makers, and fellow entrepreneurs who are leading the way in fighting plastic waste. Along the way, we'll also share tips and practical ideas so that you too can be part of the solution. This is the Plastics Revolution. In this episode of Plastics Revolution, I chat with Stephen Webster of Integrated Recycling, an Australian manufacturer of recycled plastic products. In this show, we learn about the origins of the company and how it's progressed from making posts from the recycled plastic film that was used to cover grapevines to making a much greater variety of products. This includes their Duratrack railway sleepers and their in development urban noise barriers, both that have the potential to use a huge amount of recycled plastics in Australia. I hope you enjoy this episode of Plastics Revolution with Stephen Webster of Integrated Recycling. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tammy. It's delightful to be here. Yeah, well, you've been a part of Integrated Recycling for a while, and the first time I heard about the company was actually in a previous interview with Mark Yates when he was talking about your railroad sleepers. So before we go into any kind of detail, why don't you tell me a little bit more about Integrated Recycling? How did the business get started, and what does it do? The genesis of the business was the idea of taking table grape vine covers and turning them back into posts for the table grapes to grow on. So that simple idea was the start of a business called Oz Plastic that was started in Mildura in northwestern Victoria back in the mid-2000s. In 2010, Integrated Packaging Group, as we were then, purchased uh, Oz Plastic for a couple of reasons. One, that Integrated pa- Packaging um, was Australia's largest manufacturer of stretch wrap and stretch wrapping equipment. And um, a huge amount of work in making very thin films, so therefore using less polymer to, to perform the functions uh, of uh, a, a wrap plastic, but wanted to acquire an ability to be able to make recycled plastic products. So the appeal of the business in Mildura was that it didn't first wash plastics before they were used. And there was a significant supply of material that our parent company made anyway and was supplied into that region. So the idea of taking that plastic back and reusing it to make product was really appealing. So the business became part of the Integrated Packaging Group in 2010, which has since gone another corporate change, and we're now part of the Propac Packaging Group, which is an Australian publicly listed company. Okay. Now, you're talking about the washing of plastic, and that that's kind of unusual because I do know that most places do wash it. Um, sometimes it's dry washed, like they do at Plastics Forest. How do you guys get away with not washing the plastic if you're using it as a recycled material? The key aspect of that was driven by two things. One, Mildura is a desert, and there's a limited supply of water. And secondly, by creating a wastewater stream, that would also then need to be treated. So our process enables us to be able to shred and densify the plastic and Through that process, we remove any metals or other contaminants that might affect our equipment, but also the process knocks out um, some of the dirt, but 
some of it will make it through. And that's probably a little bit of the rustic nature of the materials that we make. That little bit of dirt doesn't really affect us in uh, the use of agricultural films. Oh, that's incredible. If you guys can do it without water, why can't other people do it without water? I can only talk about what we do. <laughs> That's your secret ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more that I don't know how other people are necessarily doing it. And I think it was a, a really important aspect of why this business worked. And it probably means that we don't make certain very highly coloured or, or highly refined looking products because we do take a more agricultural approach to the use of our products so that our products are there to perform a function much more than have a look. Yeah. And so when you started off with the, the grape cover, yeah, was that always the fact that you knew that there was a lot of wastage? And so basically you were trying to find a way to do something with that plastic at the end of it. Did you like did you already have products in mind when you started using that cover? Or was it first we have this resource, what can we make out of it? Look, I can't actually speak to the the founder's uh, original concept, but what I understand was they thought that there'd be a market for uh, vine posts made from recycled plastic. And it made a neat story that the material from which uh, these were to be made had already been used to cover the um, table grapes as they grew. So that aspect of the story was appealing. But from the integrated packaging group's idea of this business was that they made a lot of table grape vine covers that were sold into that district. And then to be able to take back some of those that were uh, had reached the end of their life and then turn them into whether it's vine posts or the idea was by then that there, there was a range of products that the business was making that we could use some of them within our group and the others could be then sold to outside parties. Yeah, so you already had a readily available customer because the same people that were buying the, the vine covers were potentially customers for the, the vine stakes in the ground. Potentially, but as as it turns out, you know, an idea might be good, but it never it never really eventuated. Vine posts uh, are not a big part of our business because the price of the recycled plastic post is in excess of the price of the treated pine posts that are most commonly used in the vine industry. So we have moved into other products as a consequence of that, rather than concentrating on the um, on that industry. Oh, interesting. So are you finding that other products you make are, are more competitive with the the timber or the wood alternative? Yes. Yes. So that products made from traditional materials like timber or concrete um, are the ones against which we compete. And we have a, uh, a strong market in a, in a quite a wide range. And it probably reflects a lot of what Australia is. It's very broad but not necessarily very deep in its markets so we have to have quite a wide range to ensure that we can have available to the marketplace lots of different products it's an interesting challenge isn't it because yeah. with the things that you make and i did notice you had everything from uh, agility equipment for dog parks to benches and bollards and and, and I do want to talk about your railroad sleeper soon. It just seems like every time you have to make a mold, though, for those types of products, that that's just additional cost for you guys. And the marketplace have often said that the recycled plastic, um, even bollards, are actually still more expensive than the timber ones. And that's been one of the challenges with the adoption, converting to recycled plastic. Are you finding that, that changing in the marketplace? Yes, look, that is definitely changing, uh, and it's changing for two, two reasons. One is that the recycled plastic products are durable and will outlast um, the environmental degradation that is caused to timber products, and people are starting to take account of the whole-of-life cost as a consequence of that rather than just the immediate cost. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really important factor because... The cost in the cost of timber 
is not necessarily built the full cost, the environmental cost of the product itself. So when we're taking end-of-life plastics, we are then uh, being able to reutilise, but the whole cost of reutilising and repurposing that material is born in the product itself. So that's a challenge and we need to ensure that people understand the real key benefits of using products made with recycled materials. When you talk about the business case, though, of, of using a recycled product, if we just take out even the environmental impacts and, and the cost of that, and we just look at it from a business case perspective, I've seen something on your um, website that talked about the whole of life cost because of maintenance. Could you talk us through an example of, of why it would actually be a, a more financially viable decision to use a recycled plastic product instead of something, that, say, out of timber? Sure. Let's take a simple example of a bollard. If a bollard um, is made out of our material, um, which is about 80% recycled plastics, I use that in the plural because we use a mixture of polyethylenes and polystyrene uh, to make our product. It's a solid product, and apart from mechanical damage, i.e. something very heavy um, running into it and breaking it, it should last 40 years plus. Wow. A timber bollard will not last that long. And so then will need to be replaced on a on a cycle. And, and I'm not sure of the entirety of their full life cycle, but that one, you have the cost of a new replacement product, but it's the labour cost to uh, install that that really drives up that whole of life cost for a, a timber product compared to a recycled plastic product. When we do discuss the railway sleepers, I'll give you a more specific example of that. Mm. Say that your product lasted twice as long, which I know you, you said you have a more specific example, then cost of the recycled plastic bullard, from what I can tell, is not twice the price necessarily. No, it's not, it's not twice the price, but then you've got to add in the labour cost of, of doing that work. So you then have um, immediately a much more expensive product mm. over its life cycle if it's made from timber. And the same thing with our outdoor furniture. There's no maintenance required. They don't need to be revarnished or repainted in the way that um, a, a timber product would. Sure. So we find that the use of our uh, outdoor furniture uh, and its acceptance in the marketplace is very strong. Who are your customers right now? Are they mostly like businesses and government or are they the end user as well? It's much more businesses, local government, parks, uh, authorities, schools, but then and less so the uh, individual consumer, but we do we do have some of those, but our approach has really been a business-to-business -business approach. Yeah. It makes sense with the kind of products you make. I, I noticed how heavy some of them are, but I guess, yeah. I, I guess it helps with the endurance as well. Well, it does, but also we're not really set up as a um, retail, you know, retail environment to uh, sell to the uh, individual consumer. Mm. During this time, though, with um, so many businesses being impacted by COVID, and especially you're in Victoria, where there's a, at present a, a, another lockdown, I noticed that some of the manufacturers are, are starting to create new products for the consumers because they're finding it harder to, to get government's attention right now. Are you guys doing anything different because of the, the COVID crisis at the moment? Not in terms of product, but in terms of process. Absolutely. Mm. Um, at being part of a of a public company, we are very conscious um, of how well our people are able to cope with the restrictions imposed in different states and different jurisdictions for the um, to cope with the the COVID restrictions, because we have factories that span from. Uh, Perth to Auckland, and everybody's at different stages. So we've got one rule about how our factories operate mm. um, and how people, if they have any semblance of a cold or symptom, they are to see their doctor and or get a COVID test and not come to work until they're cleared. So that process has changed, as has the cleaning regime within our, within our factory. We've been able to have our factories operating continuously and 
touch wood and, and with good management to ensure that um, people are properly looked after. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly a responsibility that all businesses are, are taking pretty seriously right now. Yeah. And the accelerated use of um, video conferencing has been a real boon through COVID. And we have a hookup every, early every morning through all our factory sites. And we monitor exactly what is happening with uh, anybody who has any colds or, or COVID-like symptoms and track them to ensure the health of everybody. Yeah, that's great. Are, are you finding it impacting demand right now as well? It's hard to say. Um, it, there was certainly in the wider business when uh, the there was a change in what was going on in some industries, there was a massive uptick in uh, requirements. Mm. And in other industries, particularly food service, there was a lowering of um, demand. Yeah. For our business, it's been pretty steady looking back to prior years, and we have our normal cyclical um, up and down. Well, that's really good because I think I think most businesses are um, either thriving or, or surviving, and, and it sounds like you guys are just business as usual, which is great to hear. Yeah, and you know you have the end of financial year glitch that always takes people's eye off what they're doing as well. Sure. But it's been reasonably solid without being spectacular, but certainly not being devastating. Yeah. And we've been able to ensure that everybody in our group uh, re has retained their jobs through this process. Wow. And, you know, we've got all our office staff working from home, um, wherever they be, except in New Zealand, they're starting to return to the offices. Mm. So it's been a substantial change in how we operate. Sure. And what about on the supply side in terms of your, I guess, your recycled plastic resource are you able to get all that from your own usage or, or from your parent company or, or are you also purchasing like polystyrene from another supplier? So we take a regional approach. So we get most of our materials locally around Mildura and there's an informal circular economy going. So styrene is streamed separately by the Mildura landfill and, and brought to our factory and we get it from retailers, pharmaceutical and growers and the polystyrene box manufacturer up there. So we have large sources. If we need more, we um, bring some in from the Eagle Hawk Recycling Centre in Bendigo and, and sometimes further afield from that, either from Melbourne or Adelaide. The film and plastics, the flexible plastics and the rigid plastics really all comes from the Mildura area. Now, some of that is made by our parent group uh -huh. and then, you know, ends up back at us, but we don't identify it as just our, our parent group um, materials. We collect uh, table grape vine covers from around the district and um, and others and growers bring it into us and uh, as does uh, irrigation tapes and pipes. And so there's a number of different types of forms of the plastic, but it's predominantly polyethylene that we use. Yeah, I think that's been the number one uh, story that a lot of people have talked about is the fact that there's plenty of resources to use. It's a matter of creating the demand on the other end of it. Correct. Now, that's what makes your, your Duratrack sleeper so interesting to me. Let's talk about that one a little bit more because it seems like it uses a huge amount of plastic and as a result has a lot of potential for helping with this bottleneck that we have with the lack of demand for the market uh, on the product side, yet we have plenty of supply of the, of the you know, plastic available for use. Correct. Our move into that product was really prompted by my... Uh, experience and um, of load-bearing plastics and finding that our plastic could be formed in a way that could carry loads. And I was really wanting to push the boundaries of what we can do with our plastics. And through testing and experience, we um, saw that there was there were significant markets in infrastructure that could be available for this sort of product. I was asked to join a program that was initiated by the Public Transport Authority in Victoria to look at developing a recycled plastic railway sleeper for the Tourist and Heritage Railways to replace 
timber sleepers, which were, have become in a, a dwindling supply. Mm. And that started back in 2014, and Mark Yates's then business replays uh, joined us in that pursuit uh, at the time. And but there were no guidelines in Victoria. Um, there were no standards in Australia that related to the use of recycled plastic in railway sleepers. So. First, the Institute of Railway Technology at Monash needed to write guidelines, and then we made the uh, the sleepers to those guidelines that were then tested in the lab and tested in track with a number of um, tourist and heritage railways around Victoria, including Puffing Billy, and that's really where that whole process started. Why would the tourism types of railway <laughs> railways be so interested in, in an alternative source of um, sleeper? They weren't particularly. Okay. Other than they were a safe option that was controlled by the Transport Authority and they could then trial this in a safe, uh, risk-aware environment to prove whether or not they were viable. The only thing that a railway sleeper has to do is hold the gauge of the rail. Mm. So it needs to be able to hold itself within the ballast of the track and it needs to be able to hold the fasteners that secure the rail to the sleeper. And it was th that's the critical requirement of any sleeper made from any material. And that's what needed to be determined. And this seemed a, a, um, an effective way of assessing that, first of all, before then looking at it in a broader context of the mainline railway. Yeah, so so basically a proof of concept without a lot of passengers allowed you to test it for weight bearing more than anything else. Correct. So the rail industry is a very safety conscious and risk averse industry. So to take on any new initiative, they've got to be convinced that it is going to be safe and um, a valid um, use of their a time to do that. Sure. And there's other benefits too that are not just environmental, right? If you get this right, then surely these things are going to last a lot longer than the timber ones. Well, then we come to the story specifically Queensland Rail, who you would not think of as a great innovator um, or any rail company necessarily <laughs> is a great innovator in, in the use of recycled plastic materials, set out in the beginning of 2016 to find alternate material sleepers. They've got millions of timber sleepers in their network and they wanted a program to start replacing those sleepers. So they set out with a, a expressions of interest to seek people who would be interested in um, supplying alternate material. And by that, it means not made from traditional materials of timber, concrete or steel. So we put up our hands and went through the EOI process and then a tender, and was successful in that tender along with two other companies, one from Japan and another one from Australia, to then run a, an in-track trial. The reason that Queensland Rail wanted to do this is that their timber sleepers were changed on average every 14 years, so it became economically and environmentally unsustainable to carry on that practice. So mm -hmm. one of the requirements of any alternate material sleeper was to have a design life of 50 years. Wow. So that's what we've developed with the Duratrack sleeper. So a sleeper that can last 50 compared to 14, that, that's significant. Yeah, well, concrete does. Does it? Absolutely. Concrete lasts at least 50 years. Okay, without any kind of deterioration. That's right. But it's not the material they're wanting to use. They're wanting to find uh, alternate materials to concrete, steel and timber. There are pros and cons of, of each of those types of materials. But one of the problems with concrete is that it's very heavy. Yeah. And it can be brittle, so it can crack. The idea of the types of materials of the three successful tenderers that have gone through the in-track trials. There's us with a recycled plastic product. There's a Japanese company with a virgin fibre reinforced urethane product. And there's uh, an Australian company that ha has a um, another composite 
material product that is also made from virgin materials. So they didn't set out with the idea of developing a product made from recycled material. Ah. They just wanted an alternative that was going to last, be safe and be able to carry the loads that, are, that they require. Okay. So has those trials been completed now? Yeah, the trials have been completed. So over in the 18 months that to the end of May this year, about four and a half million gross metric tonnes of freight has passed over the uh, the two trial sites identified uh, by Queensland Rail where they put in all these trial sleepers. And look, my last visit pre-COVID up to Queensland, we were watching the trials and the testing and everything seemed to be going really well. So we're now waiting for Queensland Rail's assessment for us, uh, whether they will type approve our product for the next stage, which will be commercial supply. Wow. And they're looking to replace up to 700,000 sleepers over five years, which is a substantial amount of product. And what's the approximate in recycled plastic with that use? Um, let me get my calculator. It's got enough zeros <laughs> on it. Um, <laughs> so, it seems like a lot. <laughs> uh, well, about 31,500 tonnes. Oh, my goodness. If it was all made out of our material. Yeah. But, you know, obviously, uh, if we got a portion of it, it's a portion of that. That's why where our approach has been, or my driver has been, to find deep markets for this sort of material. Mm. And we saw that load-bearing capabilities, if we could establish it through testing and uh, trialling and give people the confidence that the product can do what we, we know it can do, then we can create these deep markets that will enable us to recycle a lot of material, but also create a business, create a new industry, create new jobs, create new jobs in regional Australia. So there are lots of boxes that are ticked through um, the successful use of this product. Yeah, for sure. And that's just Queensland. So if you're able to successfully do this, there's no reason why it couldn't be expanded to other states and territories and even overseas. Well, yeah. So we've got a trial going on at the moment. It's been for a year now with Metro Trains at Richmond Railway Station. And we've got a trial, trial with um, V-Line as well at their Wyndham Vale stapling yards. Yeah, brilliant. So we've got concurrent trials uh, happening and and. We're talking to a number of people about a number of projects mm. that uh, we plan to do with the railway sleeper. Yeah. But the interesting thing is that our patented formulation, is it's similar to what we put into our outdoor furniture or our bollards. It's tweaked to give a desired performance and outcome for the Duratrack sleepers, but it's, it's largely uh, the same product. So with that said, then there's no reason why some of your other products couldn't last nearly as long. Oh, our products last, but it, they won't necessarily be able to carry the loads that work in that engineered state that's required for railway sleepers. Yeah, but if a railroad sleeper, even though it's under force, can last 50 years, a bullard could potentially last just as long. Correct. Correct. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's a business case that it's still a hard conversation with government when they're looking at each financial year separately. Are you finding, other than Queensland Rail, which is obviously looking at things a lot longer than other places, are you finding these conversations with your enterprise buyers, I guess, more receptive when you're talking about the fact that they don't have to replace them as often? Yes, particularly the leadership shown in Victoria through their Recycled First policy that was announced in May to give priority to the use of recycled materials in infrastructure projects yeah. and that the major transport infrastructure authority has then tasked an agency, Ecologic, within it to pursue that policy on behalf of the Victorian government. So I'm seeing that there is a significant shift in awareness by government as the client for these major projects during their big build to initiate new behaviours. Now, whether it's the use of recycled materials, whether it's social enterprises, 
um, being engaged in the uh, with profit stream, if it's the training of apprentices, uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, all those parameters are being considered now in the injection of government funds into these infrastructure opportunities. Yeah, it looks like Victoria is well ahead of most other states and territories when it comes to both, I guess, promoting the use of recycled plastic, but also actually doing something on the back end as a buyer. It, it's something actually I think could be the case study for all the other governments and territories and councils that are still struggling with this, this idea that they should buy recycled materials first. Yeah, so we find that we have a large number of customers that come back regularly and that are, you know, government or semi-government type buyers because they understand the characteristics and the capabilities of the product. Yeah. It works for them. Yes, it costs a little bit more, but not over the long term. And they realise that and they value the product and um, take pride in the fact that they're using it. Now, I've also had a complaint or, or two from purchasers that say that it's not always fit for purpose. And we're not talking specifically about your products, but some of the ones mm. that others are selling that have deteriorated quite quickly and there's issues with what they promise versus what they get. Yep. A bit of greenwashing, it sounds like, in similar product lines. Are you still getting that kind of skepticism from government or is it because you've done it so much that you're able to prove that the product is fit for purpose or is it just the fact that you have these, these tests done that give you the certification that gives government the confidence to purchase more of your product? Um, all of the above, if that was one of the choices in the multiple choice questions. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> But one of the progressive councils in Melbourne, um, I was referred to the other day, they said, oh, look, we've had some experience with recycled plastic products, you know, they didn't really work very well. And I said, okay, when was that? Oh, about 20 years ago. Mm. I said, have you kept up to date with what's happening these days? Well, oh, not really. Um, so let me take you and show you what we do and how how we do it and where, where it's being used. So there is an education piece required because, you know, early – Products in any industry may not quite live up to the claims or hopes of them, but later iterations of it do develop those develop out those kinks, and um, we know that the products work and are fit for purpose. Some are asking government to create some level of standard for these types of products. Are you in favour of that? Yes. In the railway area, where you've got a safety-critical environment, a standard is needed, and I've spent the last couple of years working on the standard. I was on a development group to help develop the standard for recycled plastic or alternate materials in railway sleepers. Really critical um, where you've got a, a, a really highly safety-conscious environment. For non-safety or non-critical uh, products, the standards are probably can be less stringent, but what are the materials that are being sourced? Where are they coming from? Are the products being made locally and with what level of content of material is being used? So some of those requirements, which can fall away with greenwash, can support the good work that, that some of the local manufacturers are doing. Yeah. And, and there certainly are a number of great manufacturers here in Australia. Correct. Correct. But if there are government procurement policies for recycled plastic products, it's got to be Australian-made recycled plastic products, not products that are brought in from overseas. Yeah. And their content level of plastic is important too. You know, where is that plastic being sourced? Is it reusing um, the plastics that are uh, government desires to be used and how can they be reused? Yeah, good points too. Stephen, we've talked a lot about the company, but we haven't spoken about you. Uh, I've actually heard that before you got involved in integrated recycling, that you were actually practicing law. Is that correct? Yes, I was. I, I studied law at university and practiced it for, for about a dozen years, um, both in Australia and overseas. Uh, and it was a, you know, a terrific opportunity to be able to study here and um, I planned to go and study overseas and had a place to study in the UK. But um, when I got there, what was going on in practice was far ahead of what was going on in academia. So I 
practiced in London for five years and it was a it was a terrific opportunity um, to be able to work and live in a in a different country as I can detect you are doing the same and, <laughs> but I came back to Australia and practiced law in Sydney and then in Melbourne but I sort of reached the end of where I wanted to take law and I couldn't see myself being a partner of city major city law firm for forever and just had an urge to do something else so I moved out of the city and and went into manufacturing but then I was manufacturing pies <laughs> rather than um, than plastic but I've always had a desire to be in 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 business rather than in law so you're manufacturing like meat pies yeah meat pies and the the business that I helped develop created the gourmet pie market in Australia and still exists today. Oh, no kidding. What, what's it called? Uh, Boz Castle. Oh, wow. So that was about, you know, that was that was my practical MBA in the <laughs> conversion from, from law to, to business. And, and then so you went from practicing law, making meat pies, and then how did you end up in the sustainability space? I then uh, was working and helped develop a company called Storm Sustainability, which was making and marketing rainwater harvesting systems through the early 2000s and the and the great drought. Mm. Um, and always had a, a real, really strong interest in sustainability, but also in growing small businesses. So when I finished my time uh, at Storm, um, I was asked to look at this opportunity by Integrated Packaging Group and the acquisition of Oz Plastic to develop this this business, which is now called Integrated Recycling. And so 10 years later, I'm still doing that. What an incredible career journey. I, I don't think most people could plan that one. No, you look, and I think that's we're very fortunate that you can take those opportunities and look at other ways of applying your knowledge. It's it's um, it's a good journey. Mm. Oh, such an interesting one for sure. So as, as you're looking forward, Stephen, right now, what are your greatest challenges? Scaling. So um, I'm still on that journey of building this into a scale business. So whether it's through Duratrack or a combination of Duratrack and some of the offshoots that we're getting um, from this, and one of those is a company in Sydney called Blocks Industries is using the material we make for Duratrack sleepers to provide safety supports for mobile plants and equipment, which can then be elevated for maintenance. So we're using all the learnings from the Duratrack products and creating these uh, patented blocks that can stack and interlock with each other to then put heavy pieces of equipment on for, for maintenance. And the other the big area that we're working in is we've got a, a research project with the University of Melbourne on the development of using our materials for noise wall barrier. Is that for like larger buildings or could it be used in a single room? No, it, it's being looked at for um, urban environments, for freeways, um, mm. rail corridors to protect the urban environment from the noise of, of being in the city a bit. And that too would use a lot of plastic. Yeah. Uh, it's an alternative to having concrete or glass or um, other plastics or timber. Mm -hmm. So we're using um, our recycled material formulation to perform that function. Mm. And so the testing is going really well with that. So we expect to have a demonstration of that noise wall barrier um, up um, later this year. That's so exciting because I mean, certainly those are used on all the major freeways that are being built. And to, to think about the potential use of plastic in that space is, is great. So that's where I see the challenges ahead is ensuring that we can turn this into a scale business and then drive our demand for uh, material that would then, I don't know how you drive a circle, but but to lead and initiate what we will require through our, our products in the circular economy. Yeah. And hopefully then, you know, as you were talking about earlier, there's a lot of material around how do you drive the demand for that material into products that are then reused. Yeah. You need people to buy those products. Mm. 
Thanks. Well, some really interesting future developments upon you. So that that's really exciting to hear. Um, Stephen, do you have any advice for customers that may be interested in pursuing some of these ideas and products that you are either developing or have developed already? And they're having challenges with the the short thinking budget cycles that they're having to work with. When we talk to customers about those challenges, so you're really talking about the price that they've got to pay for this material compared to a material made from traditional materials. That's correct. We can only talk about the durability, the resistance to environmental degradation, the lack of maintenance required during the term of its serviceable life, and those characteristics are critical in the use in its application. We can then support what our product can do in an engineering sense to validate that it's going to be fit for the purpose that they require. But it's up to them then to decide how they spend their money. Sure. So we can only try and persuade people to um, uh, that this is the path that uh, they should consider. If they're inquiring uh, about that, then it's usually they've got a real interest in this area. We see ourselves as a developer of applications and solutions for for people. We don't see ourselves as a recycler, despite our name, and we will be changing our name um, later this year to reflect that, so that what we're really doing is finding solutions, but we're using recycled materials to make those solutions. So if somebody's interested in talking to you about an idea... Yep. What's what's the best way to approach that? They can reach out through uh, the website and uh-huh. and make a contact through the website, or they can simply call the office. And that's integratedrecycling.com.au. Yes. And look, we actually did a, an analysis last year, and we looked at uh, of the inquiries we had and the quotes we issued, about 30% of them were non-standard. Yeah. So a lot of custom requirements. A lot of people come and say, can you do this? Oh, have you thought about doing that? And some of it works, some of it doesn't. And we're, you know, we're readily, we readily say, no, our product isn't suitable for, for that application. Yeah, You're better if you go down this path. Because the worst thing we do is trying to make something fit where it shouldn't. Mm, for sure. And then fall into that category of other products that haven't worked the way that they were supposed to. <laughs> we'll avoid that. <laughs> we definitely want to avoid that. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll make sure to send people to your website and we'll put that information into the notes as well. Uh, Stephen, before we go, is there anything else you want to share about the company or anything you're doing with our audience? I think that, that the thinking around what the circular economy can mean to people and that it can have a significant effect on our lives and how we can benefit each other is something that people need to or should just become more aware of and what great innovation there is in Australia and take pride in the fact that um, we can produce solutions in Australia and that not necessarily importing the products from overseas is the best answer just because it's the cheapest. For sure. Especially in a time where jobs are needed too. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Stephen, thank you for your time today. I've just been fascinated with the many, many uses that you guys are coming up with even for the future in using a recycled plastic here in Australia. I don't think that most people think about the potential use of the product beyond garden furniture and willy bins and um, maybe bullards, but you guys are showing that pretty much anything that can be made out of timber or concrete truly can be considered for recycled plastic materials. And you are finding solutions that are fit for purpose at such a large scale that when we think about the amount of of plastic that can go into landfill if we don't come up with some product solutions, you guys are surely finding ones that can use an awful lot of this resource. So it's really inspiring to talk to you and to hear about some of the work that you guys are doing right now. Um, I can't wait to see if you guys get the approval for those sound barrier walls because that too would be so 
such a significant use of plastic and your other projects that you're working on too. I could only wish you the best of luck because it's great for the environment and it's certainly great for local industry here in Australia too. Thank you, Tammy. I really appreciate those kind words and, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to share our story with you and uh, your listeners. It's um, uh, often hard for smaller businesses to find a voice um, and uh, I greatly appreciate what you're doing and the value that you're adding by telling these stories of lots of innovation in this space in Australia. It's my pleasure. Cheers, Stephen. Thanks for joining me for this episode. To see the links and show notes, check out plasticsrevolution.com. And if you found anything interesting or helpful at all, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to the show and to tell others. Stay tuned next week as I chat to another innovator, change maker, or fellow entrepreneur who's leading the plastics revolution. This is Tammy Vendange. Be kind to animals and mother nature. This show is produced by Johnny Pushkus. Music by Joseph McDad.